high concentration. At about eight on the night of February 27, 1943, the Norwegians pulled on white camouflage suits, shouldered their 50-pound packs, put on skis, and started for Vimork. The weather was overcast, Ronenberg later reported, mild, with much wind. They glided down a mountain and into a forest, thick with bushes and low branches. They had to take off their skis and trudge on foot through the wet snow. We sank in the snow up to our waists, Ronenberg said. Klaus Helberg led the way out of the trees and back into the faint moonlight. They put their skis back on and continued. Soon they could hear the low, steady hum of machinery, the Vamork plant. When they came near the edge of the gorge, they could see it. The great seven-story factory building bulked large on the horizon, Hawklid later said. The Colossus lay like a medieval castle built in the most inaccessible place, protected by precipices and rivers. They slid downhill toward a road running along the top of the gorge. A flash of headlights suddenly lit the snow at their feet. The men dove away from the road as two buses rounded a curve and sped past, carrying night shift workers to Vimork. At about 10 o'clock, they reached the spot from which they would descend into the gorge. In silence, they took off their skis and hid them under pine trees. They removed their white camouflage suits, revealing British military uniforms. They wanted the Germans to know they were soldiers on an official Allied mission. That way, hopefully, the Germans wouldn't retaliate against Norwegian civilians in nearby towns. Then they started down the gorge. Hanging from the branches of trees growing out of the rocky gorge face, the men slid and tumbled down toward the river. As they got closer, they saw big cracks in the melting river ice and areas of free-floating water. They stepped lightly across, splashing through three inches of water sitting atop the slushy surface. When they reached the far side, each man lifted an arm and grabbed a rock on the steep gorge wall. With his hand, Ronenberg gave the go signal. The men pulled themselves up the 600-foot rock face, inch by inch. With hands and feet, they felt for tree branches or cracks in the rock. When the fiery pain in their muscles became unbearable, they clung to the side of the cliff and rested, thinking of what their trainers in Britain had taught them, never look down. A few minutes before midnight, all ten men reached a ledge just below the plant. They gathered, panting and sweating, and waited a few minutes for their hearts to stop pounding. All right, men, said Ronenberg, let's get closer. The covering party, commanded by Newt Hawklid, led the way to a storage shed 500 yards from the plant. The roar of machines covered the slap of their boots on the wet snow. From behind the shed, the men looked out at the suspension bridge leading across the gorge. Two German guards, holding rifles, paced the narrow bridge. They never looked toward the gorge, assuming no one could come in that way. The team dashed toward an iron fence surrounding the plant. There was a gate, locked with a chain and padlock. Hawklid and Arna Kjellstrup ran ahead with heavy wire cutters, cut through the chain, and swung the gate open. Hawklid, Yelstrup, and the rest of the covering party went in first, taking assigned positions around the outside of the plant. Then the demolition team raced in. The hum of the machinery was steady and normal, said Ronenberg. There was a good light from the moon, with no one in sight except our own men. Ronenberg led the team to the door of the plant nearest to their target, the high-concentration room, in which the heavy water equipment did its work. He tried the door. Locked, he whispered. The plant's windows were covered with black paint, blocking light from escaping and making the building nearly invisible to enemy bombers. Ronenberg put his face to the glass. Through thin scratches in the paint, he could see down to the high-concentration room. A single Norwegian worker sat at a desk, writing in a book. Ronenberg sent three team members to try other doors while he and Frederick Kaiser started looking for the air duct. Here it is, he whispered. Ronenberg climbed in first. The space was too narrow for him to turn and look back, but he knew Kaiser was behind him. He could hear the man's breathing. Flashlight in hand, Ronenberg climbed through the duct. From studying technical drawings of the plant, he knew he had about 30 yards to go. Suddenly, he was startled by a loud metallic crack. A pistol had dropped from Kaiser's belt and smacked the duct floor. Both men froze. Through seams in the duct, they could see the Norwegian worker at his desk. He never looked up from his book. Reaching an inner hallway, Ronenberg removed a grate covering an opening in the duct. He and Kaiser lowered themselves to the floor. 
Drawing their pistols, they tiptoed to the door of the high concentration room. A sign on the door read, no admittance except on business. Ronenberg smiled. He reached for the doorknob. The door was unlocked. The Norwegian workman looked up from his notebook as Ronenberg and Kaiser opened the door. On your feet! Hands up! shouted Kaiser, pointing his gun. Nothing will happen to you if you do as you are told. Ronenberg sat down his pack and began pulling out snake-shaped explosive charges, each about a foot long. He put on rubber gloves to prevent static electricity from jumping from his skin to the fuses. Then he looked over the 18 heavy water machines. They looked exactly like the ones he'd trained on back in Britain. Ronenberg had wrapped charges around half the machines when the sound of shattering glass broke his focus. He turned toward a window high up on the wall. Peering down through the window frame was the face of Berger Stromsheim, part of the demolition party. Stromsheim had been unable to find the air duct. Knowing the smashing sound could have alerted the German guards, Ronenberg quickly pulled pieces of broken glass from the frame, slicing open his hand. He wrapped a handkerchief around the gash as Stromsheim climbed down into the room. Together, the two set the remaining charges and connected them to a single 30-second fuse. All right, Ronenberg said, blood dripping from his hand as he pointed to the night worker. Let's get that door to the yard unlocked. The night worker put a key in the lock and turned it. Kaiser reached forward and opened the door a crack, just to make sure. It's not that I don't trust you, he said. I'm just not allowed to trust anybody. I understand, said the worker. Ronenberg struck a match and held it to the fuse. Wait, please, cried the night worker. My eyeglasses. They're on the table. I need them for my job. They're almost impossible to replace these days. Cringing, Ronenberg blew out the match. He hurried to the desk, picked up the man's glasses case, and threw it to him. He lit another match and bent toward the fuse. I beg you, wait, shouted the worker. My glasses. They're not in the case. Biting back fury, Ronenberg blew out the second match. Where are your damn glasses? The worker pointed to the desk. Ronenberg ran back over, shuffled through the papers, found them, and handed them to the man. A thousand thanks, said the worker. Ronenberg lit a third match and held it to the fuse. Go, he shouted. Run! Run as fast as you can! The time seemed long to us who stood waiting outside, remembered Newt Hocklid. We knew that the blowing up party was inside to carry out its part of the task, but we did not know how things were going. Hockelid held a pistol and grenades. Next to him stood Jans Poulsen with his finger on the trigger of a machine gun. What could be holding them up, Poulsen whispered. I wish I knew. Then it came, the sound of an explosion. The windows around the high concentration room blew out. They felt a rush of air race past them. The door of the German soldiers' barracks opened and a soldier stepped out with a rifle in one hand, a flashlight in the other. Shall I fire? asked Poulsen. Not yet, said Hockelid. The soldier swung his light across the snowy ground around the plant. Hockelid and Poulsen stood with their backs flat against a shed, just out of view. The soldier turned back toward the barracks. Ronenberg and the demolition team came racing toward Hockelid. Together, they ran out the open gate and gathered about 30 yards from the fence. The Germans still don't seem to know what's happened, Hockelid said. All ten men scrambled down the gorge. They slid from one wet icy rock to another, resting briefly on thin ledges, then continuing the slippery descent. At the bottom of the gorge, the ice on the river had continued melting. Big chunks were now spinning in the rushing black water. The men were leaping from chunk to chunk when the scream of Vamork sirens ripped through the air. It was as if we were being pursued across the river by the shrieking sound itself, Ronenberg reported. We slipped and fell, grabbing onto rocks and blocks of ice. They made it across and immediately started up the far side of the gorge. They reached the top and ducked back down just as a car raced past on the road in front of them. Then they crossed the road, found their skis and poles, jumped into their white camouflage suits, and sped across the snow away from the road. German cars and trucks kept zipping past us, remembered Jans Polsen. That was all to the good. Those Nazis were in too much of a hurry to get to the morgue to look right or left as they raced along. The gunner side team split up, most heading on skis to the Swedish border, 250 miles to the northeast. Newt Hocklid and Arne Kjellstrup stayed behind in Norway to help organize the anti-German resistance. They skied to a mountain hut, 
found radio equipment that had been stashed by other resistance fighters, wrote out a short coded message for London. High concentration installation at Vimorque completely destroyed on night of 27-28. Gunnerside has gone to Sweden. Then they headed deeper into the wilderness. You can bet the Germans are in a fury, Hockelid told Kjellstrup, and you can be sure that they'll search every corner of the mountains. Only later did Hockelid learn how right he was. Enraged German commanders were already sending out a 10,000-man German force to track down the saboteurs. Not a single one of the Norwegians was ever caught.